The story of the sun starts 13 billion years ago with the Big Bang. In an instant, the universe was born, and since then, it's been expanding at the speed of light. Within the universe, there are a hundred billion galaxies. Our galaxy is but one of them. In it, there are a hundred billion stars. And towards the outer edge of one of the spiral arms is an almost insignificant dot. A medium-sized, not very bright, undistinguished star. Up close, it's a different story. On the planets closest to the Sun, Mercury and Venus, the heat is intense, their surface is scorched. Further out through the solar system, the sun's rays weaken until they are powerless against the chill of space. The outer planets are frozen, but in the middle lies the Goldilocks planet. Not too hot and not too cold, in fact, it's just right, and life has flourished in the warm glow. All life on Earth owes its existence to the sun. It powers every natural system and sustains every plant and animal. Without the sun, the planet would be a barren, lifeless ball of rock. Recognizing that power, humans have always worshipped the sun. But we have also always striven to understand it. These monuments are more than just temples. They are calendars and observatories, tools for studying the sun. And some of them are still operational. This is Orkney. To live here is to know the importance of the sun. In the summer, the days are long and full of light. In December, it's a different story. It's a midwinter. It's about 11 o'clock in the morning. It's still not light completely. There's a strong wind coming in off the Atlantic and it's cold and it's wet. And that's pretty much typical of this time of the year up here. Yet despite the cold, in the Stone Age, 5,000 years ago, a civilization thrived here. The island is covered in the remains of their society. The ruins are full of mystery. We know little about the people who lived here. But they did leave evidence of the important role the sun played in their lives. Mays Howe, a thousand years older than the pyramids, is one of the finest examples of Stone Age architecture. Well, entering Mays Howe, you have to crouch right down, and they're confronted with a passage which seems to actually go on and on and on. Slightly feel an impression of going uphill, up slope, and coming through clearly another doorway. Suddenly, the whole thing opens out into the most amazing chamber. This alone is probably the highest and largest enclosed space that Neolithic Orcadians would have experienced. When it was excavated, when it was first entered back in the 19th century, the clay floor was littered with broken pieces of human skull. This is a place of the dead. This is a house of the dead. Most of the time, the occupants of the tomb were left in complete darkness. Then, at sunset on the winter solstice, the shortest day of the year, something amazing happens.
The light of the setting sun shines straight up the entrance tunnel and illuminates the interior. Well, the significance is that it's marking the shortest time of the year with the least light. And from that point on, slowly and gradually, light is going to increase, the days are going to grow longer. So what's happening here is that the dead, the ancestors, are being awoken on that shortest day. The winter solstice events at Maze Howe demonstrate an intimate and precise knowledge of the sun's movements through the sky. It was the first step on our journey to understand the sun and its many effects on us. To complete that journey, we've had to travel to the furthest depths of space and to the heart of the smallest atom. And with every closer look, the sun has always surprised us. To our ancestors, its power was its reliability. Always on time, never changing. But the reality is proving to be very different. Most people think of the sun as quite a boring, constant sort of thing. But in fact, it's not at all. It's changing all the time. And if you look, you can see those changes on a matter of minutes or hours. And it's far from uh, static and boring. It's, it's changing and it's got a life of its own. Modern solar observatories magnify and filter the sun's light to get past the constant glare and give a clear view of the surface. This is the actual face of the sun. It is turbulent and boiling. Never the same from one second to the next. The surface bubbles like a giant bowl of porridge. Each bubble is a thousand miles across. The heat and light brought to the surface raises its temperature to 6,000 degrees centigrade, enough to vaporize solid rock. And the sun is huge. You could fit the earth inside it a million times over. Periodically, huge explosions rip through the surface, releasing the energy of a billion atomic bombs in seconds. All this is on the surface. To understand the sun, we must know what is going on deep inside. That is where the power is generated. So for centuries, scientists have been devising ways to probe the heart of the sun. Some of them have been complex, and some of them very simple. And the first step is to figure out just how powerful the sun is. It's easy to appreciate the power of the sun on a, on a nice uh, hot summer's day, like here in the Texas Gulf Coast. And you can feel the power of the sun in your skin, sunscreen's on. But man, the sun is just, you know, the, the, the the actual physics of what's going on inside the sun, the power that the sun, the energy that the sun is releasing, is almost beyond comprehension. But it is only almost beyond comprehension. And you can measure its power output with some simple apparatus. One of the earliest experiments to try and measure the actual power of the sun was by astronomer William Herschel in the 19th century, uh, where he had the brilliant idea of just watching a piece of ice melt to see how long it would take and therefore from the properties of the ice work out how much sunlight was coming to the ground. As a demonstration of the sun's power, it doesn't look that impressive, but Herschel realized that he could use the time it takes to melt one bit of ice 